pretty amazing. Amazing God. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6. And we left off about verse 10. And uh, <laughs> once again, the, the worship is right in line with the teaching. No surprise, right? We shouldn't be surprised by that. That happens often. I want to begin this morning, though, with a little bit of levity. I know it's not, not my normal practice to begin the teaching with uh, a little bit of lightheartedness, but this seems to fit the teaching. So I read recently about a young man named John who received a parrot as a gift. The parrot had a bad attitude and even a worse vocabulary. Every word out of the bird's mouth was rude, obnoxious, and laced with profanity. John tried and tried and tried to change the bird's attitude by consistently saying only polite things, playing soft music, and anything else that he could think of that would clean up the bird's vocabulary. Well, one day John reached his limit, was fed up with the parrot with the attitude and the foul mouth, and he yelled at the parrot, and well, that was what the parrot was looking for, and so the parrot yelled back. And so what ensued was a shouting match John being obviously much bigger than the parrot, finally grabbed the parrot, opened the freezer door, and threw the parrot in the freezer and shut the door. Well, the squawking continued. It sounded like the parrot was beating his head against the freezer door, screaming and hollering and profanity. And after two or three minutes of this, then it was dead silence. And John waited a couple, three minutes, and he thought, oh, man, maybe I've killed the parrot. So he opened the door, and the parrot walked out very nicely on John's arm. And he said very calmly, I believe I may have offended you with my rude language and actions, and I am sincerely remorseful for any appropriate transgressions that I may have made. And I fully intend to do everything in my power to correct my rude and unforgivable behavior. Now, John was shocked by this and taken aback, but before he could say what happened, the parrot continued and said, may I ask what the turkey did? <laughs> Sometimes people need a little motivation. <laughs> well, that fits, and you're wondering, okay, how are you going to make that fit? <laughs> that fits Ephesians chapter 6, starting at verse 10 through the rest of the chapter, very nicely. We're dealing in this section of Scripture with spiritual warfare. And sometimes we forget all that we have at our disposal. And so this message really is meant to encourage you or to motivate you to continue the fight. Now, some of you may be wondering, what fight are you talking about? Well, then this lesson will be some information for you. The truth of the matter is, brothers and sisters, that the Christian life is not what a great number of American Christians believe that it is and has turned it into. It is not. The Christian life, brothers and sisters, is spiritual warfare. 
It is spiritual warfare at its very basis, in its very essence. Everything that we do each day, the things that we're involved in, there's spiritual warfare raging all around us. And if we don't understand that as the basis for our living the Christian life, then we're going to get off track. We're going to get way off track. Now, again, the intro that we did this morning for our January uh, Bible study with resisting the green dragon is a perfect example of that. There's been so much false teaching, and in that, the instance of environmentalism, false religion that has invaded the church today. And it's happened because, by and large, Christians are asleep at the wheel. They're just sleepwalking through life. American Christianity, not all, but a vast number of American Christians, they've fallen into this thing where living the Christian life is supposed to be about happiness and joy and what I can get out of this life. And they've insulated themselves from the reality of what being a Christian is really all about. It would only take about five minutes in a foreign country, be it Pakistan or India or, or some other place, to find out in a real hurry that living the Christian life is not what Americans think it is. That it's actually being on the front lines. And that's what Paul's describing here. Now the context is, remember, he's under house arrest. And this takes us all the way back to the beginning of our study. The context is that Paul's under house arrest. And that he's writing this from Rome. And so he's basically a prisoner. So I imagine that as he's thinking about how to finish this letter, and I say finish this letter because of uh, verse 10 of chapter 6, notice the first word, finally. So he's thinking about how to conclude this letter, and he's surveying his surroundings, and I believe that there's a Roman soldier. And so he begins to think about the soldier and how he's attired, and he begins to relate that then to the Christian life. Okay? So that's the context. Let's get into the word and see what it has to say. Paul says in verse 10, chapter 6, finally, concluding thoughts, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Now, what it doesn't say is, be strong in your own understanding, be strong in your wisdom, be strong in the plans of man, rely on your own efforts, depend on yourself, you can do it. No. We need to remember first and foremost that we are strong in Christ. In Christ. Folks, that has to be the starting point. If we don't understand where our strength comes from, and if we don't understand that if, if we refuse to abide in Christ, under His shelter, under His authority, if we step out of that and we begin to operate in this Christian life by our own wisdom, by our own plans, and in our own strength and what we think is right, we're going to get slapped down. Elsewhere in the scripture, it talks about our enemy being a roaring lion who prowls about looking for what? People to devour. Well, you know who he devours? He devours people that step out of or from underneath the authority of Jesus Christ and begin operating in their own strength and not the strength of the Lord. Because the truth of the matter is the enemy cannot devour you and cannot defeat you when you are living under the authority of the Lord and you're living by his strength. Now, does that mean that, that you won't ever stumble? No, that doesn't mean that at all. And we're going to see this played out. So finally, be strong in the Lord. So our strength, our only strength is in Christ. And when our life is yielded to his leading, we are strong. 
So be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. And we know from other passages in the scriptures, brothers and sisters, when we're talking about being strong and being in the strength of his might, we need to understand the magnitude of that strength. It is resurrection strength. It is the power that raises the dead to life. If you're a note taker, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, that whole section was about that kind of power. Paul said, listen, you were once dead in your trespasses and sins. And, but then he goes on to say, but God made you alive. That's the kind of power and strength that we're talking about here and the strength of his might. Put on, verse 11, some of the pieces of armor of God as you think that you might have need for them during your day. Oh, that's not what your translation says? No. Put on how much of the armor? Full. And that means all. All of the armor. But notice whose armor it is. It's God's armor. See, sometimes we think it's ours. It's like, no. Remember, he's already talked about strength and being strong, but that is in Christ. This is God's armor, okay? So we're called to put on God's armor. And the reason that we're called to put this armor on is why? So that we will be able to hunt down demons... So we'll be able to chase them down and wrestle them to the ground and so that we will be... What does it say? So that we'll be able to stand firm. So we'll be able to stand firm against the schemes, against the methodia, against the cunning and craftiness of the devil. Now... <laughs> as soon as you start reading passages of scripture that talk about the devil, talks about Satan, you lose some people. Even in churches today, not here, but in many churches today you lose people. Why? Because they say, well, that devil stuff, that's not really true. I mean, there's evil in the world, certainly, but evil is generated by man. It's man that's evil and has brought about all this stuff. There's no such thing as the devil. Well... That is not the testimony of the scripture. These schemes of the devil, they can be blatant, but other times and most often they're very, very subtle. What is Satan's favorite strategy or method of implementation of any of his tricks or schemes? It's deception, isn't it? He's wanting you to think other things while he's actually doing this. So we're to put on the full armor so that we will be able to stand firm against the schemes. Now, if we don't know what those schemes are, it's awfully hard to stand against them, isn't it? So we have to live our life with eyes wide open, don't we? We have to be in the scriptures and we have to be, as Paul's talked about throughout this letter in Galatians, we have to be living in the power of the Holy Spirit so that we have a sensitivity to what's going on all around us. Now some people may ask, well, if I have this strength that he's talking about in verse 10, if I have this strength, well, why do I need armor? Well, the armor is the strength, brothers and sisters. The armor is your strength. And when we put the armor of God on, then it reveals to us Satan's strategies. Why do you think some people are able to just see very keenly, and you know who they are, you read their stuff, you buy their books, you listen to their teachings, it seems like they're very right on with their evaluation of what's going on. And even though you may not have seen that at that time, when they give an evaluation of it, or they critique it and they begin pointing things out you say yeah that's right well it's because they're they're clothed with the full armor and they're living in the power of the Holy Spirit and what they're speaking to you is godly wisdom and so we're called to stand against all of these schemes now he says in this standing firm though against these schemes 
He says, I want you to understand something. And that is when we're standing firm against those schemes, we're not standing against people. He says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Now notice that he didn't say, if we struggle. So that goes back to my point. It's not a matter of if we're involved in spiritual warfare. It's just when it's going to flare up again. The Christian life is spiritual warfare, brothers and sisters. That's the base assumption. That's the base understanding. The enemy is coming against you. Whether you recognize it as such or not. So our struggle is not against flesh and blood. So it's not a, against people. But against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces. So what we're reading here is that our enemy uses people. People become pawns of our enemy. And he directs their paths. And that's exactly what the rest of this verse says. So our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness. Notice, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. So the real movers and shakers are in the spirit realm. It is in the spirit realm that world forces are directed. Now there's two contexts here. And I've pointed those out. There's an earthly facade of people. But behind that facade are demons controlling people. Now, some people say, well, I don't, I don't know about all that. Listen, you do the study in the scriptures. Demons are real. Amen. Yep. Demons are real. Demons are the third of the angels that sided with Satan, Lucifer. You can read about it in, in uh, Ezekiel. You can read about it in Isaiah. When, when, when Lucifer was cast out of heaven, a third of God's created angels sided with mm -hmm. Lucifer and were cast out as well. Now, we don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us how many angels God created. Could be hundreds of millions. So a third could be a significant number. Now the thing about Satan and the fallen angels, demons, is that they do not have the characteristics of God. Angels, including Satan, Satan was an angel. They do not have the characteristics of God. They were created, just as you and I. Created along a different order, but nonetheless created beings. And the reason I'm laboring that point is so that you understand that, that Satan is not omniscient. He doesn't know everything. Only God is omniscient, has all knowledge. He is not omnipresent. In other words, he can only be in one place at one time. Amen. <laughs> now, cause, now, I know some of you feel like, well, I don't know about that. He must be following me around for the last week. I don't uh, but. Well, good, then he's leaving somebody else alone, right? <laughs> but he, he can only be in one place at one time. So he doesn't have the characteristics of God. He's a created being, is, is, is the point. But demons control, I believe, control world governments. They're influencing. Well, how could you say that, Mike? Well, name me one government on the face of the earth that is God honoring. For those of you listening on the internet, it's crickets in here in the sanctuary. Because <laughs> there isn't one. They're all influenced demonically. Well, how could you say that, Mike? America's a good nation. Well, define good. I believe America's a good nation, yes. In that a majority of the people intend to do good. But if that intention to do good is not aligned with the scripture, then can we really as believers call it good? See, it needs to be evaluated against a standard of good, doesn't it? How do you define good? So demons 
are controlling things in the spiritual realm. So Paul says on that basis, notice verse 13, the first word, therefore. So on the basis of what he's just said, our strength is in the Lord and understand what we're facing, what we're up against. It's spiritual warfare. It's not the warfare that we think we're fighting with people. And I know it sure looks like it's fighting with people sometimes, doesn't it? Amen. All of the, the that goes on today, I understand that. That's why for the Christian, it's okay to oppose the ideas and behaviors of people, but understand what's behind that. And pray for that one. I think that's why the Lord instructed us to pray for our enemies. Understand that their behavior, the positions that they hold on, on any topic, their ideologies, that's really demonically inspired if they're not a believer. So pray for them. Pray for th that God would release them from that bondage and captivity and sin. So therefore... Paul says, take up the full armor of God. And I'm going to read this through and then explain it. But then I want you to see the real application. Take up the full armor of God so that you'll be able to resist in the evil day. And having done everything to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth. Having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In addition to all, taking up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit which is the word of God. Now, again, remember, I believe he's looking at a soldier and he's describing the armor or the, the battle gear of the soldier. Girding your loins with, with truth, the soldier would, would take a belt before he entered into battle. You've seen some of, the, some of the movies. Soldiers in those days, in the Roman army at least, wore togas of varying lengths. Before they went into battle, however, they would put on a belt which essentially gathered up that toga and kept it out of the way, contained around the body so that they wouldn't be tripping or wouldn't be loose ends flopping around and all that stuff. So that's, what, that's the picture. On this belt then they would also attach a, a scabbard. They would put on a breastplate. You've seen it with the washboard ribs and you know. Well that was to protect the vital organs. You could take a hit in the shoulder or the arm and continue to fight. You take a hit to the heart area or lungs or stomach and you're done. So they wore this breastplate to protect those vital organs. And then their feet, in verse 15. Most Roman soldiers, they wore a very tough leather sandal because they did a lot of marching. And the Roman army was known in, in the height of its glory as an army that could travel faster than any army the world had ever seen. In force, they could get someplace very, very quickly. Well, that required a substantial uh, pair of shoes. And what they would do when they entered into battle, very often they would drive spikes through the top of those through the foot or the sole of the shoe in through the bottom inch, inch and a half spikes so that they would have traction when they're fighting hand to hand. That way, if it was muddy or slippery terrain, they wouldn't have to worry about falling. They could hold their ground and, and, and fight. And then in verse 16, it talks about taking up a shield. Well, there were a couple of different shields in use, but the shield that's talked about here uh, in the grammar is the big four-foot Roman battle shield. It's about two and a half feet wide, about four feet tall. Very tough leather shield. If you've seen the movie um, Gladiator, the opening scene of that battle, when the barbarians were firing stuff and they all got behind the shields. Well, that's the kind of shield it's talking about. And often what they would do is, before they entered battle, they would soak that shield with water. So it became a little heavier, obviously. 
But what that did for them then when they soaked that shield, when fiery arrows came their way, they would extinguish. They wouldn't have any place to burn. And so that's what we're reading here. Take the shield that's able to extinguish the flaming arrows. That's the picture that Paul's giving us. And the helmet, the helmet of salvation, or the helmet, was a, was a helmet had varying styles, but it was made of uh, steel. And for the most part, unless it was a direct blow from a big broadsword, the big battle sword, unless it was a direct blow, it would protect the head. And then he says, take up the sword. And the, and, and the word there for sword is not the word for the big battle sword, the big three, four foot long battle sword. It's instead the word for the 12 to 18 inch sword that they wore on their belt that they used for hand-to-hand -hand combat when they got in close. So that's the picture. Now, why is he giving us that picture and what in the world does that have to do with the Christian life? Well, let's break it down. He says, verse 13, take up the full armor of God and notice that we're called to resist. We're called to resist in the evil day. When is the evil day? Today. Today. In your time. In your day. Today. We're called to resist. We're called to stand firm. He says, having done everything to stand firm. And what he means by that, having done everything, is in preparation. You've prepared for this battle. Well, what's the first step in preparation? Knowing that you're in a battle. Right? You have to know that you're in a battle in order to start preparing. And so you take up the armor in order to resist today. So... Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth. Here's what I think he's talking about. The basis of the Christian life, brothers and sisters, of living it, is knowing the truth. The truth, brothers and sisters, first of all, for the believer, is what? A person. It's a person. Jesus is the truth. Now following that, because here's, and I'll point this out when we get down here to help the helmet of salvation. But following that, understanding that Jesus is the truth, is understanding that the word is the truth. So when it talks about girding our loins or preparing ourselves for battle, it's talking about, listen, you need to prioritize your life. You need to get a handle on the things that are loose ends, and you need to tie these things up, and you need to bring them all together, and you need to get the truth that's going to shield you and keep all of this other stuff out of the way that's going to prevent you from hand-to-hand -hand combat. Get ready is what he's talking about. This speaks of readiness for battle, securing our garments, securing the loose ends of life so that they don't interfere with the battle. Use God's truth to do that. People say, well, I think this and I think this and I think this and, I, and then I'm going to make decisions based on this and I'm going to live my life based on this. And it's like, well, that's all well and good, but does it match up with the Scripture? You know, sometimes we bring trouble on ourselves when we go in directions that clearly contradict the scriptures. And then we, then we say foolish things like, well, I don't understand why God's not helping me or why God's not here to deliver me or why God's not blessing me. It's like, well, it's because you're going in direct contradiction to his revealed word. He's not going to bless that. You need to bring all of that in under the authority of the truth of God. And then he will bless that. So, gird your loins with truth. And notice that it says, having girded your loins with truth. Past tense. Do you know that you cannot even enter into the battle? And Well, let me just point this out. So you having girded your loins with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet. Those are all past tense things, aren't they? 
You can't even enter into the battle, brothers and sisters, until number one, you're born again. Amen. You're not even called to, but you don't even know a battle's existing. Mm -hmm. But once you're born again, then your eyes are opened up. Then you know who the truth is. You know what the truth is. Although I'm the first one to admit that understanding the truth of, of God is a lifelong endeavor. So gird your loins with truth. Put on the breastplate of righteousness. Now, this is not talking about, and, and I've heard this teaching and so have you. This is not talking about put on Christ's righteousness. This is not imputed righteousness as the scriptures talk about. We already receive that. When we're saved, we have Christ's righteousness, right? So this isn't talking about imputed. I think what it's talking about is imparted righteousness. And what I'm, the distinction is this. We are called to live holy lives. We are called to walk in holiness. Be ye holy, for I am holy. Paul told the Philippians, what? Work out your salvation. Yes. Be about holy living is what this is talking about. The breastplate of righteousness speaks of sanctification. Mm -hmm. We're already justified when we're saved, right? God removes us out from under wrath. We're delivered from the penalty of sin, which is death. That's justification. Sanctification is something completely different. Sanctification is learning to walk in holiness. And as we learn to walk in holiness, we understand that not only have we been delivered from the penalty of sin, but we are being delivered from what? The power of sin in this life. That's when we start saying no to the enemy. And of course, ultimately, we know that we will be glorified one day when we go to meet Christ. And of course, then we're going to be delivered what? Not just from the penalty of sin. Not just from the power of sin. But one day, we're going to be delivered from the presence of sin. No more. So... Gird your loins, put on the breastplate of righteousness. It's a daily walk in holiness, brothers and sisters. And having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Now, ladies, he's not talking about making a trip to DSW. <laughs> Men, if you don't know what DSW is, just leave it alone. <laughs> what is, what is shotting your feet? What does that mean? Because I've heard over the years, and so have you, this means evangelism. That means going out and sharing the word. Well, not in this context. What are we told here? The context is fighting spiritual warfare. The context is standing firm. The context is resisting false teaching. I think what he's talking about here is that we need to understand that we are anchored in. Just like the Roman soldiers that have the, the cleats in their sandals to help them stand firm. I think what the apostle's talking about here is that we need to understand the assurance that we have that we are at peace with God. That we are at peace with God and that we have the peace of God. That's what he's talking about. And notice it says the preparation of the gospel of peace. We need to understand that for ourselves. In addition to all, take up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Well, the shield of faith is exactly what it says it is. It's faith. Do you know what extinguishes, and by the way, the fiery darts of the enemy, what are those? Those are temptations. Is there anybody here that hasn't been tempted lately? <laughs> Temptation is a, is a daily occurrence. And I know sometimes we think, well, does it really rise to the level of being a temptation if it's just a little thing? Don't you think for a minute that Satan just comes at you with big things. 
Because if he can get you to stumble, he doesn't care whether you stumble over a little thing or a big thing. A temptation is a temptation. So the shield is our faith. And it's our faith that extinguishes temptations. You know, when temptation comes, we're faced with a choice. What's the choice? Am I going to believe God or am I going to believe the enemy? That's the bottom line. Now, you may not see it like that. You may think, well, I'm, I'm choosing between what I'd really like to have and what I'd settle for. And it's like, no, no, you need to see behind the curtains. Because all choices have consequences, don't they? Every choice. Whether we, we think it's a good choice, bad, whatever, they all have consequences. So you begin to think about those consequences and sometimes the Lord will reveal to you this isn't from me. When you begin to think about the ramifications of a decision, you think, well, nothing good can happen from this. Bingo. Well, it's not from the Lord then, is it? So in addition, take up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Those are temptations. And take the helmet of salvation. Now, the helmet of salvation, we're not talking about your salvation as an individual. And I know that's been taught a lot, but that's not the context. Remember, you're already saved or you're not even in the battle. You're not in the battle if you're not saved. That's the first step. The helmet of salvation, remember what the helmet does. It protects the brain. Satan will come at you and he'll use the big broad sword and he'll try to crush you with those blows. The helmet of salvation, brothers and sisters, is talking about the assurance of our salvation. We sang about it this morning. Rock of my salvation. We know that we know that we know. That's the helmet. Put on the helmet. Protect your mind from the attacks of the enemy. That's what he's talking about here. He's not talking about salvation. If you'd like, you can read uh, Romans 8. For you note takers, 28 through 39. Talks about the assurance of our salvation. So put on the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit. And he tells us what the sword of the spirit is. It is what? It is the Word of God. Yeah. Now, at the risk of upsetting some of you, I want to tell you that this, there's nothing magical about this book in and of the material stuff that it's made of. Now, I know some people, they get all fidgety and upset. Oh, what do you mean? That's, you know, it's a book. It's paper and it's ink. What's the important thing to remember, brothers and sisters? The important thing is that you need to ingest this. Because you can talk about, oh, yeah, this is, mm, mm. Well, guess what? If you don't know what it says and you're not doing what it says, then what good is it? Amen. It has to be in you. Some people, it's almost like it's a talisman in some people's homes. They have the big family Bible, you know, sitting out in a prominent place. It hasn't been opened in 37 years, but it's out there for everybody to see that comes over. And what's that? Is that going to ward off evil spirits or something? You got some garlic around? The Bible will do you no good if you don't know what it says. Take it in. So the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And notice what you're doing all of this on. Because <laughs> sometimes we forget about this. And we rush into areas where angels fear to tread. What's the battle based on? Verse 18, with all prayer. You know, if you're not in prayer, brothers and sisters, you're going to take a licking. You need to be in prayer. 
Make it a daily activity for you. And I'm not talking about some long, drawn-out, theological these and thous. And you just need to talk to your Father. Talk to your Heavenly Father. Be in prayer with all prayer and petition. Pray at all times in the Spirit and with this in view. With what in view? With warfare in view. Understanding that you're in a battle. Be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. Be on the alert. Do you know what that, under, you know what that means? That means that you're to be a watchman. Well, I thought that was the pastor's job. Who's Paul talking to? He's talking to the church. He's saying that you need to be on the alert and you are to persevere in this state of alertness. That changes things, doesn't it? So much of the Christian church in America today has just become some kind of happy, clappy, let's just all come and, you know, whatever. What is that? Well, we're just here to... We live, brothers and sisters, in very dark days. But they've always been dark. I'm not trying to say, well, these are any darker than... Now, personally, I think we're coming to the end of days. Amen. And so the warfare is increasingly stepped up. Mm-hmm. And I think you could make an argument that Christ's return is very soon. Amen. And so it becomes very important for us as believers to understand the days and the times that we live in. Some folks, some folks want to stay in a cocoon. It's hard for them to hear the truth of what's going on. But we are to be evaluating everything, aren't we? We can't just walk through life with blinders on. We have to understand the days and the times that we live in. In fact, Jesus criticized the Pharisees for that very lack of discernment and alertness, didn't he? He says, y'all can judge whether it's going to rain tomorrow by how the sun's today and the clouds and all that stuff, and yet you don't even know the season that you live in. There's a lot of very subtle deception, false teaching that is invading the church today. And brothers, we're all in this together to identify it for what it is. So be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. Be praying for each other. And I like this. Paul says, pray on my behalf. Well, I hope, and I know that you are, but I hope that you will continue to pray for me. Because I need that. I need the Lord to move on my behalf. And brothers and sisters, he hears you. And he answers your prayers. There are times, and and I had a time yesterday. I don't know what was going on in the heavenlies, but there was spiritual warfare going on because I could sense it in my own walk. And then it lifted, so somebody was praying. I was praying, but I know somebody else was praying because it lifted. Pray on my behalf. And he, and he asks them to do that specifically for this reason, that utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel. That's not popular today, is it? <laughs> to speak with boldness and to speak with clarity and to speak about things that people say, well, why are you bringing that up? Why are you talking about that? Do you think that we live in isolation of what goes on in our culture today? Resisting the green dragon is a very, very good illustration of that. There are forces at work in our culture today, brothers and sisters, that would place you in bondage. It isn't just about recycling bottles. In fact, that has nothing to do with anything. That's not the objective of those that seek control. What they want is they want a one-world government and they want to put all 
people under the control of governments. They want to take away liberty. And they want to take away freedom. And they want to bring us all into subjection. And they're going to do that by offering up a false religion. Now, you think, well, Mike, how do you get that? Well, how about Revelation chapters 18 and 19? Hello. One world economic system and a one world religious system. It has ever been in the minds of men to do that very thing. And we see things happening today that could pave the way for exactly that. And it is, in, in fact, I would go so far as to say that pastors are not being faithful to their responsibility to God's people if they don't stand up and identify those things that are having an impact on our lives and our faith. They're not doing their job. And it's not a stretch, and you're not going outside the bounds of Scripture to do that. And of course, you know I'm not at all afraid to do that. So we'll, we'll continue to do this. As Paul says in verse 20, I am an, an ambassador. I'm an ambassador. Albeit in chains. That in proclaiming it, I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Do you think Paul just... You remember when he went to the uh, Areopagus in Athens? He took those philosophers on head on, didn't he? And all of their ideas about God and culture. He didn't back down. And so as we ought to speak in boldness. But that you also may know about my circumstances, how I am doing... Tychicus, and now he's closing out this letter, and you can read about Tychicus in, in Acts. He was one of Paul's traveling companions. And beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord will make everything known to you. Now, that's an interesting statement to me because that tells me that you mean there's more, Paul? You held something back? There are things that Tychicus is going to share with the Ephesian churches that you didn't put in your letter? Man, how I would like to know what that was. He will make everything known to you. I have sent him to you for this very purpose so that you may know about us and that he may comfort your hearts. Peace be to the brethren and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ with incorruptible love. As I was thinking about this teaching this week, I was reminded that... <laughs> This has been captured, and I won't sing it for you. But this has been captured many, many, many years ago by none other than Martin Luther. He wrote the words to this song, this hymn that we, it's a great old hymn. A mighty fortress is our God. And listen to what it says. Boy, I'm tempted to sing it, but I'm not going <laughs> to. A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. Our helper, he amid the flood of mortal ills prevailing. We live in an evil day. For still our ancient foe doth seek to work us woe. His craft and power are great. And armed with cruel hate, on earth is not his equal. Did we in our own strength confide, our striving would be losing. We just talked about that. It's the strength of the Lord, not our own strength. Did we in our own strength confide, our striving would be losing. We're not the right man on our side, the man of God's own choosing. Dost ask who that may be? Christ Jesus, it is he. Lord Saboeth, his name, from age to age the same. And notice, he must win the battle. He will win the battle. Now here's, here's the concluding. Well, there's actually four verses, but I'll just do the third one. And though this world with devils filled, he must have been studying through Ephesians when he wrote this, should threaten to undo us. 
spiritual warfare. We will not fear, for God hath willed his truth to triumph through us. Gird your loins with the truth. Tie up all the loose ends. Because you see, God has already determined that he will win through the propagation of his truth. That is our greatest weapon. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fell him. That's right out of Revelation, right? The Lord opens his mouth and... Poof, good stuff. Well, we will start on the book of Philippians next week. It will be a great study, but it's going to go fast. Because it's only just a few chapters. And it'll go real quick. <laughs> So, of course, you know, quick is relative, right? Because <laughs> you're thinking, what, two weeks, three weeks? Well, at least four, right? There's four chapters. Is there four chapters in Philippians? Yeah. yeah. So, chapter a week, right? <laughs> hey, what else we got to do? <laughs> well, let's pray. Father, we are thankful once again, for your goodness toward us. Thank you, Father, for encouraging us and motivating us to keep on fighting the battle, Lord. And we know that the battle is already won. You are the victor. We love you, Father. Go with us and encourage us and equip us, Lord, to be all you desire us to be. I pray that you would continue to direct our paths as a fellowship, Lord, that we would be faithful to the things that you call us to. We love you, Lord. And we pray these things in Jesus' name.